sustainability. The coronavirus outbreak is rapidly changing our planning and orientations as the world is trying to cope with COVID-19 and face its consequences and challenges. At the Policy Center for the New South, we gave our annual Atlantic Dialogues flagship conference a one-year rest while embracing the rapid digitalization brought forth by the pandemic to offer a virtual alternative. This year's online AD talks are digitally bringing together the AD community that is at the heart of the conference's success, growth, and sustainability. à tous la bienvenue à ce panel. Je vous remercie d'y participer, même si nous aurions vous recevoir en réel, comme cela s'est passé dans les années précédentes. Mais euh, malheureusement, un minuscule virus en a décidé autrement. Et parlant justement des conséquences de ce virus, l'une d'elles est la santé mentale, objet du présent débat avec laquelle, pour laquelle, sur laquelle nous allons parler avec nos invités. Alors pourquoi Parce que outre les conséquences économiques de, ce, de cette pandémie, la peur de la contamination, les effets psychologiques du confinement et de l'enfermement ont eu et continueront d'avoir des répercussions importantes sur la santé mentale des populations pendant toute cette période épidémique et même au-delà. Nous en parlerons. La propagation de la Covid-19 à l'échelle mondiale a provoqué une peur et une anxiété généralisées, d'abord en raison des craintes d'infection et de la peur de la mort, puis en raison des incertitudes durables entourant la nature de l'épidémie, ses modes de transmission, son degré de férocité, de virulence et l'efficacité des protocoles d'intervention thérapeutique permettant de sauver les communautés touchées. Il convient donc de distinguer deux situations souvent confondues, les effets psychologiques causés par la peur de la propagation de la pandémie et de sa férocité, ainsi que ceux générés par les mesures visant à réduire la propagation du virus. De nombreuses personnes continueront à ressentir de profondes angoisses, une peur existentielle, des inquiétudes quant à l'avenir pendant la phase post-confinement, tandis que d'autres feront preuve de réactions pessimistes pendant cette phase en réaction de la situation d'incertitude accrue. La santé mentale, la santé tout court, la santé économique, tout est engagé. Et sur le plan économique, justement, le redémarrage des activités pourrait également se heurter à un état général d'épuisement professionnel, ce que le monde ressent un peu partout aujourd'hui, qui affecte le bien-être, réduit la productivité et empêche les espoirs de reprise. Alors nous allons donc nous atteler à ces grandes questions concernant la santé mentale avec les deux aspects aussi bien social que neurosciences et neurologiques, les deux aspects de la problématique étant liés. Avant de commencer, euh, permettez-moi de présenter donc, euh, nos intervenantes et nos intervenants, chacun intervenant d'une un, partie du monde, euh, chaque partie du monde, euh, chacun dira d'où il intervient, parce que la mobilité étant ce qu'elle est même en période de pandémie, les gens peuvent se déplacer. Alors, Madame Khouloud Ouattar Qasm, bonjour Madame. Vous êtes titulaire d'une licence en sociologie et anthropologie et un diplôme d'enseignement en psychologie infantile à l'Université de From the de Beirut, and also have a degree in, in diplomacy. diplomacy. You are a founder and uh, of, a, of, of a, a, an organization, an organization an and NGO, and you are based in Lebanon. And so since 2008, you are supporting families in 
in uh, training and vocational training and uh, teaches women and mothers to meet their own needs. You're also a representative of the Women's Parliamentary Forum in the MENA region, within which you have organized several major events, one of which, which was held in Jordan, bringing together 300 MPs and six female presidents worldwide. So hello, and we're happy to have you here with us. Professor. Professor Parfait Akana, so, vous êtes sociologue, professor anthropologue Akana, et éditeur. So you're a sociologist, you're an anthropologist and a publisher, the executive director of the Montu Institute, I hope I'm pronouncing it well, and de a Yaoundé researcher Le. professor Le. at Le. the University of Yaoundé. Yaoundé. So your work so focused on mental health in Cameroon de genre, and the sexual violence and you also focus on anthropology and communication sciences. You're also a professor at the Higher Institute of Good Technology and Science at the University Yaoundé too. And you're also an editor-in-chief in Terroir, a social science and philosophy magazine founded by a renowned personality in Cameroon. Merci, Professor Akana. Thank you very much, Professor Akana, for being here with us. Dr. Fatima Boukbeb, vous êtes docteur en neuropsychologie de l'Université Paris 5. Vous avez exercé en tant que neuropsychologue pendant 17 ans au sein du service de neurologie de l'hôpital de spécialité à Rabat, au CHU, avant de rejoindre le secteur libéral et le centre d'exploration et l'éducation cognitive et fonctionnelle, CERC, intergénérale de la société marocaine de Secretary General of the Moroccan Society of Neuropsychology and the founding member, founding member of Morocco Alzheimer's Association. You are a member of different scientific associations and since from 2013 to 2019, you were a, uh, the president of the Moroccan chapter of the uh, Clinical psychologist. We also have Mustafa Hazi, so you're here with us uh, in the studio, and so you have two PhDs. The first one, 98, obtained at the University of Tokyo on regional and international affairs, and the second obtained at the University of Mohammed V, Mohammed V, on, on, uh, on international relations, and you are also a researcher. And uh, at the Policy Center for the New South on Terrorism Studies. And uh, we are also focused on Afro Asian Studies and Extremism and De Radicalization. Mais aussi aux you have uh, taught uh, on the four corners of the world in, in uh, Japan, in the Emirates, in Emirates format, and in the US. So tout, you all know the format. Uh, so we'll start with uh, a, de a, uh, giving the floor by the, uh, to all of our guests and panelists. So each will have about 10 minutes, après, uh, uh, more or less. And then we will uh, give the questions to nos, de nos, uh, de, de nos give the floor to the respective panels based on the questions that will be asked on from our um, audience online. So we will start this debate uh, without further ado. We have about uh, 90 minutes, uh, based depending on the different uh, questions and uh, interventions that we'll have. So we'll start with you, Mrs. Kassam. We'll, we'll talk about the well-being of women during this pandemic. They are have this dual, dual strategy. Right. So having to handle the pandemic and having to handle their households and uh, and children. So this uh, women indeed had a great role to play. So, Madam, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zakaria. Um, good afternoon to all our distinguished panelists and to the audience who is following this rather very important webinar. I will start my talk on a positive note. There are always pros and cons for everything in life. The whole world is shocked with the change that has happened to the global event that has taken place in rather every country in the world. On a personal level, I believe change is needed to move from one state to the other and improve stagnant situations. I've always used the slogan that change is a sign of life, to push people to help them to think out of the box. But then if I want to think about the situation of women in my country, Lebanon, our region in the Middle East, and also the world. Women has been screaming for all of the past years for governments to take serious and intense measures to change policies, to protect them from the violence that has been practiced against them, whether it's domestic violence, verbal, or even the violence that has been practiced by the system itself, where there is no equality in pay between men and women. There is, um, and the most specific is the massive obstacles that face women to reach decision-making positions in their own countries. Women has been fighting for their rights to protection, but their voices won't be heard 
unless they are on board of decision-making positions. Now, some of the pros of the pandemic is the fact that we find women stepping in and take charge of solving problems without needing the permission of the men who usually stop them from being in the picture for we are living in a life-threatening situation and only the fittest, as you know, will survive. This is how I see it. At this point, I'm trying to reflect on the scene that is there in my country, Lebanon, with all the challenges that we have been witnessing lately. Our women are stepping in to help the people to, uh, and doing the job of the government with the current government, as well as the past governments, have failed to do so. Therefore, women's essential role in supporting the community is being realized due to the challenges that we are facing, and especially the pandemic challenge. The essential problem in the pandemic is that despite the fact that we live in a very unstable region, yet we are also unprepared to face a sudden vague enemy that has so far visited most of the families, not only in our countries, but also in the world. Some of the vulnerable ones have been affected and faced massive consequences led to their unfortunate death or permanent damage. And some others were saved and the rest of the world is facing the threat of being attacked. I speak in this way for I myself who have served all of my life in my country, of, uh, in a country of insecurity and uncertainty can realize what does it mean to live in fear of the scary unknown. In fact, because of our history and the endless challenges that we face as Lebanese, and especially women, I think we have been genetically trained, if I may use this term, to quickly adapt to the unknown. Yet the repercussions of the pandemic, in fact, has been massive across communities, across all levels, and especially on our mental health. Our lifestyles have changed drastically. Our perception of issues and problems are translated in our minds in a different manner. Therefore, we are going through a transitional period in the history of our lives. Everything around us is changing. That is why we have to invest in our mental wealth, as I say, not mental, only health. To be able to empower the support system around us and to pass this life-changing period to a different yet more powerful and productive future. I believe in few steps that we have to take through this time, especially with the crazy news that is going, is going around us nowadays about the new virus wave that is taking the world in a storm, closing all borders and locking down people in their places. I'd say that there is no general textbook that applies to all and teaches us that teaches us to be mentally healthy and wealthy. There is no right way that applies to all to rid yourself of anxiety, depression, or any other mental problem that we are facing due to the pandemic. I think people have to learn and re le read about the protocol of treating themselves and apply the ones that work best for them at their own pace. It's not going to be easy once you decide to go for it. There will be lots of twists and turns, ups and downs along the way, but you should not give up trying for you will be surprised that after this, you will explore, explore a new life that probably you have ever been looking for. Then you will be able to step out of the comfort zone and find new challenges. I had a TV, I was the host of a TV program on a Lebanese channel with the theme of, of the power within you. In Arabic, it's called El Uwi I have hosted women who have survived major life-threatening challenges just because they faced them with bold steps, making sometimes few minor changes to the classical way of facing such threats and have succeeded enormously. Just change the way we think about things, change the way we think about fear and try to embrace the change by adapting to the new life we are living. If we think about the scientific out outbreak, we'd find that in the past tens of years, with the fast changes that has taken place in our lives due to the social and industrial revolution, also with the rise of capitalism and, and, and downfalls of rigid global systems, many scholars have published theories on the outcomes of revolutionary situations like the one that we're living. There was no general theory which has been employed in any capacity beyond its decorated manner 
to capture and translate the changes that are taking place now due to the current pandemic. Now also with the new factor of the technological revolution that is introduced into our lives of into also the life of every single individual in the planet. I think that scholars have to reconsider their thoughts and try to adapt new theories to the new world, which is now the new normal. I think that much can be said about the confinement that every global citizen is facing on his or her own self due to the miraculous pandemic. Maybe the world needed such a shock to remind us about the importance of the countless blessings that we used to enjoy, which we took for granted, from the blessings of having food on the table to the ability of enjoying the hugging and kissing, the hugging and kissing of our loved ones. And most importantly, is the value of one's own health, where we lately realized that it is the source of our wealth. So dear friends, and especially my women friends who are heads of companies, mothers and caregivers, lovers and wives, sisters and workers, you have to seize the moment and make use of this difficult time and try to look at things from a different angle and adapt and embrace the changes that we're going through because I think that then we can have a different word, a better word, hopefully, if we are, we are able to face it. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Qasem, for your great ideas. 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 Je voulais faire, c'était alterner entre l'aspect neurologique et l'aspect social, mais il y, a, il, y a, il y a une transition qui est très claire avec le professeur Akana sur la peur, la peur qui finalement a, nous a tous marqués cette, 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 cette année 2020. Et c'est la situation inédite qui fait que c'est la première fois de mémoire d'homme que le monde entier parle en même temps de la même chose. Donc c'est une peur qui s'est instaurée et, et ce sont les, les anciens qui sont revenus. Dans du genre du nationalisme, du renfermement sur soi, du repli sur soi. Alors, professeur Akana, vous allez nous parler de la peur et du nationalisme thérapeutique. Nous sommes encore dans le cœur du sujet. À vous la parole, professeur. Merci. Micro. Thank you very much for giving given me the opportunity to talk during this discussion and encounter. On n'entend pas le professeur Akana. To talk to you about nationalism and mental health. Can you hear me? No. Le micro. Can you hear me? Le micro est enclenché. Y a-t-il un problème technique Ah, voilà, nous vous entendons, nous vous entendons. Très bien, allez-y, allez-y, professeur. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this matter. I chose willingly to talk to you about the fear of therapeutic nationalism during this very um, troubled period that we are experiencing that is actually characterized by the ongoing sanitary crisis. What I'd like to start by saying is that we have actively addressed the troubles as, uh, that have uh, uh, been carried out by the pandemic and a lot of writings and texts uh, were written to actually uh, really denounce uh, the uh, complicity of the international pharmaceutical companies. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, in my institute, as early as March 2021, I started a platform that was meant to really address the sanitary crisis uh, in Africa in real time. So we have produced over 180 articles of researchers, intellectuals, uh, academia, and from different disciplines because Putting an end to such a crisis from a social scientific, a scientific social 
researcher is not enough uh, because this really takes uh, a very thorough criticism. So what we did, what are we doing to what's happening in the world and how we are we going to overcome this crisis and how are we going to actually dis in a way overcome in a descriptive way the challenges that we are faced with and what are the solutions from the anthropological standpoint uh, on a global arena talking about COVID-19 and also by the uh, nature of polemic uh, nature of the topic really allows us to select two important points that I would like to share with you and discuss with you, namely on the phenomena of fear of nationalism and how we're going to overcome this crisis, what I call the therapeutic nationalism. Some uh, data are the results of some field research I'd like to share with you, but I can't dwell on all the details and examples in this presentation. During the q and I'll have the opportunity to answer your questions. Some very important investigations were carried out in the bars and the Yahundi markets, uh, very crowded areas, and have really led to uh, anthropological type of study that is in investigations. So first, the fear. After the uh, 19, uh, the COVID-19 fear, there is the history of Africa, of Africa, of uh, the uh, pandemic and historian endemic, uh, really that is faced with the fear of others and fear of us self a multiform and trauma that the African continent have, to have experienced and this is very well known among others the war famine and all type of epidemic epidemic COVID-19 from the standpoint can you hear me on vous attend vous attend professeur continuez poursuivez oui COVID-19 crisis from this standpoint uh, is this new guest of the African circle of insecurity. But what we can say in general is how the appearance and outbreak of this pandemic is contextualized in a history that gives the members of the elements of son identification comme faisant partie d'un vaste complot occidental. D'une certaine manière, ce qui permet à la maladie. Can't hear the speaker, sorry. Well, the local represented and popular representations uh, uh, fear that there is the evil hand of the West and leading to really uh, harm the population and uh, false allegations. However, the sociological analysis really compel us to go back to history and on the violent uh, nature of socialization that really lead us to carry to study the sediments of our relation with others and our relation with ourselves. So the history of the continent, continent are full medical diagnosis on the colonized. So let me use an example, Twitter, and that is the third Roman of a Cameroonian writer entitled the 700 uh, uh, blind. And that really reminds us of this very important historic fact that translates to maturity and ferocity of uh, colonization and and the, the, its uh, negative impacts and drawbacks. So the people that we have interrogated do not dwell on the details of facts that I have just referred to, but have behaviors and attitudes that really are inspired by a uh, traumatic memory and violent uh, memory that led to diseases and is transmitted in the family and in the society. So COVID-19 doesn't have that nature of interpretation that could be discussed and questioned that could even be suspicious, but as a socialist, uh, Boudou says, it conveys uh, false ideas that are uh, hyperbolic uh, interpretations. 
and ideas. And some uh, psychiatrists will tell, will call it the the lady of the uh, frozen time in the uh, stream of consciousness of Africans. So we're gonna talk about this in my second point on the uh, therapeutic, therapeutic nationalism. As one uh, philosopher, Raymond Baudet says uh, that uh, history is like a fox history. And this leads to the mobilization of local therapeutic resources and a claim of uh, uh, local competences and talents that uh, really apprehend the pandemic from its uh, local nature, but also uh, provides for some local therapies and medications to uh, put an end to uh, the uh, pandemic. I'm thinking of uh, journalists and anthropologists and uh, according to this journalist, we're, this is not the first uh, COVID-19 pandemic as this actually prevailed in the 1970s uh, under the name of Asik Bukumo. It was like a, a flu, a local flu that was attacking and affecting the elderly people most of the time. So we can see here uh, a series of theories rise and not only assumptions and theories, as they actually induce some practices and the people that we have interrogated do say that they are taking some endogenous solutions to overcome these, uh, the disease and claim a, a singular or uh, an African singularity and exceptionality with this uh, global pandemic that is shaking the world and they're claiming their African capacity to find local capacities and local knowledge and really has become what I call the therapeutic or therapeutic type of nationalism. We can see this in the interviews, but not only we hear it in our interviews, but we can see it around us with local recipes and local drinking drinks to prevent oneself against the pandemic. Beyond Cameroon, we have other examples. The uh, uh, Magosh, the most striking one. And also in Cameroon, we have the Archbishop of Guala that has come up with a uh, drug or medication that was promoted uh, and arguing that the pandemic was actually dealt with and overcome in the country. So it is important to see how the media is conveying this message and how this is received by the community. And it is actually seen as the capacity of uh, local population to find a remedy to this pandemic that is disseminating the world and devastating the world and to our eyes is really um, uh, not affecting us. Sorry, but we have internet problems. We can't hear the speaker. Sorry, but the speaker cannot be heard. I will stop here and I'll be, of course, willing to answer any questions or to provide any clarification. Merci, <coughs> Merci <coughs> Professor Akana. Il y a aussi euh, quelque chose que je voudrais que je voudrais dire, c'est que il n'y aura pas que mes questions ou les questions des, des, des internautes, mais si vous voulez réagir et interagir comme je l'ai dit au départ euh, entre vous, eh bien, il faut il faut y aller parce que je pense que sur les deux aspects nous nous rejoignons. Alors on était dans le social, on va passer à la deuxième dimension qui est un peu plus, qui est plus euh, neurologique, donc un peu plus scientifique, euh, à savoir les conséquences et les troubles induits sur les, sur les personnes âgées. Alors le confinement comme euh, facteur déclenchant des troubles cognitifs chez les personnes âgées, et même les moins âgées d'ailleurs, on, on peut on le considérer comme un dégât collatéral majeur. Et pour faire le lien avec ce que disait le professeur Akana, docteur Botrib, est-ce qu'il n'y aurait pas une sorte de thérapie nationale aussi pour nos personnes âgées National therapy, I don't know really if that is the term. And that is not my feeling. And I believe that the elderly have 
rather be misled or not treated properly properly because the whereas the first intention was to protect them rather and this is my point and my view today and i'd like to share with you and discuss with you the observations that we were able to carry out in the framework of a memory observation or consultation on the uh, Co negative consequences of the confinement and deconfinement. But before sharing with you my data, I thought it would be good to also focus on a series of things and describe the context in which the elderly were living, the social uh, situation of the elderly in Morocco, their medical condition, their psychological condition, the economic condition and situation and cultural condition of the elderly and climate condition and situation of these people, of these elderly. So all these things are important. And by adding them and summing them together, I might sound a little um, maybe too uh, obvious, but uh, uh, maybe there are other things going on and suspension time points and it really, uh, there are things that I might not be uh, mentioning, but it was the way for me to express how worried and how concerned I, I was to make this introduction because this is such a wild and vast type of subject and everything was so important. It was very hard for me to coordinate and summarize everything in such a small time span. But by doing some mental exercises, a title came to me as obvious as it, as it can be. Chronic, Chronicles 1, 2. It was like a, a chronicle of uh, announced death. <clears throat> Why this title? I'm not a psychoanalyst or psychiatrist, by why did I choose this title? Well, because I had, I thought I would present and introduce this as history in time. What just key words without dwelling in the details. And if I, if you want, we can elaborate more. I don't want to judge, but, or going into judgments, but it just a couple of points that I want to share with you. On the 2nd of March, it all started. It was on the 2nd of March, day two, and I called it the return of the prodigal son, a Moroccan coming back from Italy, maybe on a holiday or maybe to run away from COVID-19 uh, and having some good time in Morocco. So confinement, uh, so social, confinement, solidarity and courage. Uh, I have called this uh, first chapter the honeymoon, so positive things, enthusiasm, and we even e invent invented the uh, Moroccan uh, aspirator and breather and invented a local context. Morocco, we're going to call them the Azizadik, the loved ones. And so why should we protect the elderly? Because these are people that are at risk. This is what these specialists say, which should be obvious. And so a certain number of decisions arise from that. And I can mention the recommendations which aim to avoid for the virus to, and to enter into contact with this vulnerable population. So I will read these recommendations. And so it's important to hear them. And so these are the recommendations that were made to protect this vulnerable population. And so firstly, to drastically restrict or prohibit visits in collective accommodation establishments and to prohibit any uh, any outings uh, to these uh, residents outside and to contraindicate to people that are at risk to use uh, public transport and to request for these people to limit their individual movements aside unless if it is for essential anything essential and so And for the fragile persons that are not uh, housed in these uh, specialized institutions, well, they need to be in total lockdown at home and limit at maximum their contact with uh, health uh, establishments or health professionals and to limit uh, 
the contact with the uh, uh, care providers needs to be done needs to be done remotely to ensure that uh, any uh, psychological consequences are limited. So you can, uh, might have understood here that we are basically prohibiting for these people to go see their doctors. So the tone is set, and so the uh, timer has also been launched, and so we need to figure out how things were going to be organized. So three solutions were available to the elderly. So those that are um, have a, a partner or, or or a spouse will be isolated at home without any uh, contact with the outside world. And those that are alone would either stay with one of their children or to avoid being alone, or it's one of their children that will come to move in with them. So this was for, for chapter one, chapter two. So the extension of the lockdown period. And so this is when the isolation started and the lassitude. As such, the elderly that were living alone ended up going to depression, not being able to go out, not being able to exercise, start and started showing some comorbidities. And so for people that had to stay with their children or have their children come and stay with them, we started seeing uh, this difficulty in, in accepting this company in, accepting others because they had their own habits. And so their children start cleaning, start start sort of managing their lives. And so that, uh, that uh, which is quite disruptive and, and which is quite disruptive for the elderly. And this will in, in, in turn trigger a depression. The uh, medical care is also postponed during this uh, second phase. The chronic pathologies are not uh, managed because it's they cannot go to see their physicians. There are no longer any. There's no longer any physical activity, and this will, as said before, trigger a form of depression. So these are patients that are elderly, but uh, that will. These are people elderly that will turn into uh, patients, and that will start being uh, being very acting in a very susceptible manner, which leads me to the third chapter, which is the the confinement or the post lockdown period. And so here was the vacation period and Eid al-Adha, and little less solidarity was shown, and people were trying to figure out how people, I mean, everyone was trying to figure out how they could make it from an economic standpoint and uh, without having to think of others, and so it's showing some selfishness, and nobody really does, does, nobody really feels uh, like washing their hands, and uh, the latest fashion accessory it was the was the mask, which was a, a sort of necklace rather than a face mask. And, uh, and all hotlines also stopped all of their activity. Yet the pandemic has just there was a big surge, had just spiked. Hospitals uh, started uh, showing started being completely full and operating at full capacity and had no more hospital belts available for people that were in needed intensive care. And so the post-lockdown, and in fact, the elderly continued to be in lockdown, even though this was not, um, even though this was not administratively pronounced. So, and so this means that this sort of lockdown that continued for the elderly was meant to protect them. And so this led to a sort of tsunami as far as the aggravation of their psychological and mental state. Patients uh, started showing stronger signs of depression. And I end up saying patients because this is what these elderly turn into and we see them losing weight and so they will lose appetite. And so this uh, cognitive decline, behavioral disorders, and an aggravation or a triggering of comorbidity. So among the disorders that are triggered or aggravated are cognitive disorders. And in our practice, well, the patients tend to come for memory, see us, come to come and see us for memory problems. And we noticed that since the post lockdown period, the situation has indeed changed. So what has changed? First of all, the uh, tests that we performed during one 90-minute to two-hour session well before the uh, crisis was enough to uh, set a diagnosis. And, uh, and since the post-lockdown period, and so the return of uh, patients, uh, 
because the our center was also in lockdown and our activities were suspended. So since our return and our reopening, sessions and therapy sessions were no longer sufficient to diagnose patients. And so patients systematically need to come back. So this means that we need t twice as much time to to conduct these testing and all the explorations because the patients are a lot slower, the disorders are a lot more serious, and we need a lot more we need to channel and we need to channel these patients a lot more. We need to comfort them a lot more. And so this requires a lot more time. Another, on another note, we also compared over the past uh, six months from June to date, the number of patients and the type of patients that we have have been compared to the same period in 2019, so from June to December 2019. And so the figures speak for themselves. We have two, we have twice as many Alzheimer patients. So in 2019, we had 20%. And now we have 42% during the same period in 2020. So twice as many Alzheimer patients, uh, twice as many what we call the people who have uh, cognitive disorders who will also turn into Alzheimer patients themselves. So we have a almost 70% rate compared with, uh, compared, so compared to the previous year. The cognitive profile of Alzheimer patients, for example, has also changed, meaning that uh, we are noting disorders that have patients that have that are at the beginning stage of Alzheimer's that have the same stage as those that are have reached a second stage Alzheimer's who, that had been diagnosed in 2019. So, in addition to memory uh, memory uh, troubles, we have we have noted the psychi psychiatric and uh, psychological disorders um, that were not uh, existent prior to the crisis. So these disorders are related to the lockdown, but also to the post-lockdown, because as mentioned, these patients are always more or less still end up being in a lockdown situation due to them being elderly. So I expose the, the, the condition of the elderly, but this is the same profile can be copied and pasted with uh, uh, some slight changes for children that are also more or less sem in a semi-confinement semi uh, situation right now. So I will leave it at that. but I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions and uh, further Dr. deepen the uh, discussion on any point. So, so thank you very much, Dr. Boutrieff. This is very frightening. Série euh, en trois ou quatre temps, your... on va appeler ça la saison 1, une série d'épouvante, si on devait appeler, c'est véritablement une série d'effroi et d'épouvante. Moi, je, 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 je retiens ce chiffre de deux fois plus d'Alzheimer, plus in, toutes in, les, 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 les catastrophes que vous avez si admirablement décrites et qui sont absolument inquiétantes et effrayantes. Alors, la Covid-19 a eu, a eu euh, plusieurs, alors le maintien du confinement pour les personnes âgées, etc., euh, la, la, la rupture de relations avec ou de visites chez leur, chez leur médecin et tout ça, bien entendu, Va créer, euh, va créer des problèmes dont on n'est pas encore sorti, d'où la saison 1 dont je parlais, parce qu'il y aura malheureusement une saison 2 très certainement et 3, même quand la pandémie sera passée. Alors la Covid-19 a eu beaucoup d'impact, on le sait, on le vit encore, des impacts économiques, des impacts sociaux, peut-être politiques, certainement financiers. Euh, il y en a d'autres qui vont, qui, vont, qui vont apparaître. Mais il y a le côté psychologique aussi. Et le côté psychologique commence à inquiéter. Parmi les autres impacts qui vont arriver, il y a ceux de la propagation des menaces et celui aussi des restrictions sur la santé mentale. Professeur Zalazi, vous me voyez venir. Comment accompagner les personnes vulnérables et même les moins vulnérables Quand je dis les personnes vulnérables, je parle des niches, y compris les prisonniers, par exemple, y compris les personnels de première ligne qui sont, qui sont exposés, qui sont directement en confrontation avec la pandémie. Merci 
and and of course can lead to <coughs> I mean uh, some psychological disorder we have also that impact uh, cognitive process of human being and we are talking so but we talk about something which is very very specific and important which is I mean uh, cognitive disorder but also there is its impact in the process of of, of the cognitive system, talking about cognitive dissonance, for instance, where when you cannot have, I mean, well-being state of thought. attendre quelques secondes, ça ne devrait pas dépasser la poignée de secondes pour régler le problème technique. Donc, euh, allez-y, professeur Azadi, poursuivez. So, uh, and of course, uh, finally, we have also, I mean, specific impact that, I mean, uh, uh, is reduced to the behavior. And uh, of course, those three processes, they are in the same panel, but sometimes the impact is different from one aspect to another. So as you mentioned at the beginning, talking about uh, the physical effect of COVID on well-being and the mental health of the population uh, requires maybe to dissociate three levels. The first one is the impact of the propagation itself. At the beginning, I guess, uh, one, one, two, three, I mean, from basically from March to the beginning of May, we, we have faced how people <laughs> were motivated by this uh, fear of infection that generate anguish about death. And of course, I mean, those who are familiar with psychoanalysis, so has, has increased this functionality of death and life drives. <coughs> Les instants de la vie et de la mort. So this is quite interesting because it has created a state of existential fear we have seen uh, even in social media in in discussion among communities the second stage which has affected the behavior is much more related to the confinement restrictions and of course the some so our daily life has affected by those addicted behavior that we used to do so we were in a situation that so many uh, that cannot be able to, to, to adapt themselves. Mainly talking about how specific communities, basically we are talking about the population, but also among the population, we, we have those who did have a previous uh, mental health disorder, those who are addicted uh, with drugs and alcohol, and those in some special situation like uh, inmates in prisons. So personally, I, I did have that chance to, to work for three, four months with other, I mean, uh, colleagues <coughs> in terms of, I mean, to supervise, to, 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 to take care of this community. And we, it was quite interesting because talking about someone in prison, he basically the first impression we did have that he will not have a problem with confinement. But when you compare with those who are in society, I mean, the, the perception of confinement, the impact of confinement was much more increasing and manifesting on their psychological well-being. Just because they did have a double confinement, their own feeling, and of course they are sharing with the society, of course the media has impacted them definitely, and, but also their families that they cannot, I mean, get in touch with them, mainly when the department in charge of prisons in Morocco has restricted the visits between families. And it become real two worlds. I mean, the wall take a real sense, the wall of the, of the prison, because with this discourse of confinement, people were not able to identify what is going on outside the prison and has generated a lot of, I mean, difficult situation inside prisons. 
Uh, another element which is quite important, and of course there was uh, so many writings about that, is this lack of information, valuable information, <coughs> uncertainties about the virus itself. So it has also created uh, dysfunctionality of the perception of the population at large about the notion of the future. So we people have spent few weeks or let's say two, three months, they did not have the capacity to project. And this is something, I mean, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't covered, or it is not covered by the mental health sciences, but it's uh, an emerging phenomena that we should take it into consideration. Maybe in in maybe we need to to identify some chapters uh, named uh, mental health in time of crisis. I mean, even today, the guidelines that we do have, the SM and others, they have never pay attention to provide such specific training for for professionals on the on the issue. And finally, there is some other issues that we can talk about. Uh, my friend Jong Sung, uh, one of the founding authorities in Korea in mental health sciences from Yonsei University, who was talking about the blue corona, which means that we and those affected and those professionals in front lines and those policy makers, including the general director of World Health Organization, all of us were under some degrees of dis psychological disturbance because of the virus. So this blue environment mm -hmm. is affecting everybody. So which means that in terms of diagnostics or in terms of assessment, we should take this part into consideration, which means that we should modify our criteria and our classification tools. So those elements uh, from, well, a professional point of view seems to be quite interesting. M maybe another aspect is few interest was, uh, uh, well, uh, people, I mean, professionals were less interested to the impact on children. And mainly, of course, on social aspects, there were a lot of voicing, but uh, in terms of m cognitive impact, for instance, uh, those who are familiar with the media, you know that this picture that has emerged in screens and TVs about the, the symbol of virus, the coronavirus. I guess that kids less than 10 years, they have maybe confusion to identify if this picture is the real representation of the virus or not. And it can affect them in terms of the, the, the conduct they should adopt. So those debates seems to be very important. Of course, we are not over yet. We have issues coming out, uh, a burnout that has almost uh, started to emerge. And it might affect, you talk about the political and security aspects. I guess that uh, 2021, uh, my perception personally, that we will face uh, this psychological impact on uh, social peace in our societies. Merci, merci, professeur euh, Zrazi. Alors, ben, on, on continue. Ce, ce n'est pas toujours euh, très agréable, mais bon, c'est toujours l'inquiétude, effectivement, qui, qui est... On entend burn-out, euh, euh, sous-estimer l'impact sur les enfants, alors que les enfants, c'est la génération de demain, et il risque d'y avoir un problème à ce niveau-là, et les populations vulnérables d'une manière plus générale. Euh, J'ai une question pour vous, madame Qasim. Je vous la lis, telle qu'elle est arrivée depuis le début de la pandémie. Le nombre de violences faites envers les femmes n'a fait qu'augmenter, principalement la violence domestique. Les femmes victimes de ces violences sont souvent de plus en plus isolées, ne trouvant pas de refuge ni de personnes pour les aider. 
Comment faire pour éradiquer ce fléau et venir en aide aux femmes victimes Vous vous y êtes déjà attelé, vous avez déjà commencé à donner une partie de la réponse lors de votre intervention, mais plus précisément parce que on sait, il y a des chiffres qui ont montré, paradoxalement d'ailleurs, quand on, quand on regarde les chiffres qui, de, 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 du mois de juin, juillet, paradoxalement, on, on s'est rendu compte que par rapport à 2019, il y avait dans plusieurs pays, moins de violences déclarées, mais c'est euh, déclaré euh, aux autorités. Ça revient très certainement aux, aux conséquences du, du confinement. Alors, selon vous, comment faire pour aider ces femmes Ce qui est passé est passé sur le confinement, le déconfinement, mais dans la situation à venir qui va allier aussi bien les dégâts euh, conjugaux que les dégâts économiques, bien entendu. Vous avez entendu la, la question, madame Elle vous est parvenue. Everywhere in the world, and statistics said that uh, uh, it's uh, um, you know uh, it's spreading everywhere in the world. In our part of the world, in, in uh, especially in Lebanon, with all also the threats that we have and the challenges that we have, uh, domestic violence has has risen more than 30 percent uh, with uh, with people, and it's also happening. Uh, we checked in in uh, in the Americas and uh, in uh, in most of Europe. Um, it's. I think it's. Uh, it's uh, normal that this thing, because also um, the, um, uh, you know, uh, there is the um, economic problems that people are facing, and uh, the uh, fact that they are living with each other where they did not use to be living with each other all the time. The details of, uh, uh, of of seeing the details of each other by living, uh, um, you know, uh, at the same time, uh, this um, caused a lot of problems. And uh, the future, um, I think. Madame um, Fassi. Hello. C'est bon. Oui. You can go ahead, Madame Cassie. Pour yes. Madame. Uh, so I think that uh, the situation is uh, in all of the countries with the situation of women is uh, has has been really uh, um, um... Ah. Nous avons un problème de connexion avec euh, Madame Kassim, semblerait-il. We have a connection problem with Mrs. Kassam. But Madam Kassam is still there. Mrs. Kassam is still there. Are you still here with us? No, it seems that we have lost the connection. So we will find her back. We will find her back. Because she will not be able to return. Very She will certainly. Professor, Professor Akana. I will read a text. Is that what you can hear, Professor Akana? To you, a question. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Can you hear me, Professor Akana? Très bien. Donc, je vais vous, je, je, je vais vous lire un texte de quelques lignes. Vous devriez le reconnaître. L'essentiel des offres de soins se trouve chez des tradis praticiens, des prêtres et pasteurs qui, d'un point de vue sociologique, constituent le recours le plus immédiat et le plus accessible pour les patients et les familles. Ici, la question des thérapies religieuses est importante. Ils font parfois un travail important là où l'État échoue à proposer des offres de soins concurrentes, convaincantes et robustes. Ça vous dit quelque chose, professeur Akana C'est votre contribution au monde diplomatique en janvier, donc avant la propagation mondiale de la pandémie. Et aujourd'hui, comment font ces tradis praticiens face à cette, à cette menace plutôt inédite Well, with this coronavirus crisis, what we have observed 
is the full mobilization of uh, traditional healers and traditional practice practitioners who have created an association and they have stated that they had a solution, a healthcare solution, namely uh, responding to the call that was launched for all healthcare uh, providers to come up with collective uh, gatherings and associations to provide healthcare services. What I can say that despite the fact that uh, traditional healers and practitioners uh, have a community uh, echo and acceptance, the, there is a long path to validate their uh, therapeutic uh, practices. And most of them, it is a real challenge to uh, get validated because of structural problems. Uh, their capacity to get organized, to start associations, to mobilize funds and resources in order to validate their work. And even sometimes, as I said before, they're faced with organizational problems. And this has been really uh, prevailing in uh, the practice of the traditional practitioners even if most of the times they're the ones who have a very large acceptance uh, at community level because most of the time people believe that the state is really missing and uh, lacking to provide a very high level and high quality healthcare service uh, namely in these kind of challenges Merci, Monsieur and health challenges Akana. faced by people madame uh, thank you nous attendons Akana. toujours le retour de madame Qasim apparemment c'est une c'est un ennui de connexion qui 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 traîne un petit peu on espère que ça passera et qu'on la retrouvera. Madame euh, Votrib, je voudrais revenir avec vous sur la question des enfants qui ont, qui ont subi, entre autres chocs, trois chocs majeurs. Le premier, c'est la déscolarisation, passant brutalement du, virtuel au, du, du réel au virtuel, sans préparation technique et encore moins euh, psychologique. Deuxièmement, la désocialisation, les enfants étant séparés de leur famille et de leurs copains de leurs amis. Et la troisième, la violence conjugale auquel ils assistent et qui n'est pas forcément physique, qui peut être verbale. Et elle est très souvent beaucoup plus verbale que physique et les enfants assistent à ça. Comment vous voyez cette évolution, cette évolution psychologique des enfants pour les mois et surtout les années à venir et pour la suite de leur vie evolution of these children and the impact on their future and on their lives. As I said before, children as the elderly are the collateral victims and the most important collateral victims of the confinement and the pandemic in general. First, they have the de-schooling of these children and uh, homeschooling. And these children were not prepared for that. It just really came overnight, and they were faced with that challenge overnight. And there was a return or a back to school time. And but despite the children having been prepared, they weren't as well prepared as that. And this is not unique to Morocco, by the way. It is really an international trend. The return to school was not in full physical presence. And in most of the schools, they were half in physical presence and half virtual homeschooling. And one of the consequences of the pandemic is that when there was a case of COVID in a classroom, so they would move to a total homeschooling or virtual or remote schooling. So children were not prepared for that psychologically and mentally because uh, children lost their references and really uh, kind of uh, they, they lost their references and they lost their psychological uh, footprints as well as the elderly so they lost uh, there was a loss in terms of pedagogical learning and cognitive learning i cannot really put uh, data on this, but it will be around one or two years of uh, school cognitive knowledge loss. 
those who are in the confinement and even now children have been hardly uh, submitted to uh, screen addiction because of the homeschooling first on extensively using the, the screens and children are not all all the time in video conferences with the teachers and most of the times they are left alone and they're are just using the screens by themselves. It was that the consequence is a very important pedagogical loss and a psychological pain and a start or birth of addictions that we were fighting prior to the pandemic, but that, that these kind of addictions uh, grew bigger. Madame internet problem it's uh, just the fact i just want to say this uh, short sentence that the domestic violence violence yes has risen across the world and uh, unfortunately governments are unable to solve that problem and they cannot do and cope with it uh, in uh, in our part of the world in lebanon for example uh, uh, whenever there's a domestic violence like for example the husband or the father uh, uh, you know uh, abuse their their uh, their woman in the house they would say that they are their uh, uh, you know their father or you know their their, their people um, who are responsible for them so they cannot do anything about it uh, at this point especially with all the challenges that are happening uh, unfortunately at this point there is no vision there has to be governments they have to take uh, change policies as to protect women uh, from uh, from abuse across the world and execute these pro these uh, these policies not only just put these laws without uh, without execution uh, so uh, you know with all the stress and all the challenges that we're facing and especially all the burden that's on women. Some of them, they work outside the house and they have to go back to the house and they have to deal with their children and their spouses. Uh, the stress that they have, uh, the, the spouse, and then they say, uh, you know, um, they cannot, uh, they just cannot deal with it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the situation is, uh, is chaotic at this point. Merci, merci, Madame Kassim. Professeur Zalazi, est-ce qu'on peut dire que après la découverte de vaccins, on pourrait dépasser ces problèmes Monsieur Wazrazi, can you say that after the vaccination, all the discovery of the vaccine, all these problems will be solved? Or with the exception and generalization of the vaccine, these psychological and mental problems will be solved? We make sure that these uh, psychological les problems les or mental health problems are not going to be expanding uh, in the future or going to well, have an, a long-term impact. This is what we do heard about. If the vaccine is, well, is really that, uh, generalized. There is a serious problem about, uh, let's say, confidence building among the public opinion today. I mean, confidence building in different sense. I mean, there is no responsibility to... to to the project on one side against the other, but it was generated because of this situation of uncertainties that has, uh, I mean, spread since uh, uh, month number one up to date. And this, 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 uh, this lack of well-being, the, 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 the lack of, uh, or let's say, the lack of the capacity to project in the future uh, basically, in, in, in mental health sciences, we are talking about post-stress traumatic disorder, uh, which normally manifests a few months later uh, after, after, after a disease or after a crisis. We have a burnout that, uh, of course, also manifests later. We have, uh, I, I am not sure that... Uh, the discovery or even i mean the, the the accomplishment of mass vaccination for the population will stop the, the psychological impact uh, in a certain way and in immediate way i, mean, I guess that uh, we will see more increasing manifestation coming out by the next coming months even maybe years 
the impact was strong and even it was affecting cultural aspects. I will tell you something which is far away from psychological discussion. In, uh, I mean, what we are facing today, I guess that the virus has, has, has uh, uh, play the role of company to bring us to, to be familiar to the robotic world, to the smart city security model, uh, to the virtual world, and we are not aware about these elements. Uh, basically, every day ça I come ça here. Trop vite. We, ça every trop day, vite yes, every day I come here to the center. I I I, I show my hand for the guard man to to check the temperature. Maybe if you ask me to put a code bar, I will accept that. I, I will admit it maybe in the next coming years. So these these impacts are, I guess, they are they are invading us, our way of thinking, our way of behaving, and definitely the impact will be there. I mean, I'm not sure that we will be ready to recover our, our uh, normal life within the next coming months. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Merci. Merci, Dr. Zrazi. Uh, nous avons encore une petite uh, poignée de Dr. minutes, mais on va essayer de caser quelques uh, questions qui nous arrivent de nos interlocuteurs. On, on, in on est obligé uh, de uh, arbitrer. Professeur Akana, une question directement pour uh, vous, si vous le permettez. La question de la santé mentale reste tabou en Afrique. La santé mentale est tabou en Afrique. Mental health in Africa. Moins de 10% the, uh, de la population a accès à des soins de santé mentale. Pourquoi est-ce le cas Première question. Et en deuxième, uh, quelles seraient les solutions it, pour dépasser so, cette situation Et faire de la santé mentale sanitaire pour les populations Thank you very much for raising this issue. In fact, we have a vast program, and one of the solutions would, first of all, to invest in mental health resources in, in fact and to have the pro, the right human resources if we were to take a country like cameroon we have about uh, I mean, since about since about a decade where i was working on my thesis we had on average two to three psychiatrists for a population of 20 inhabitants and today in 2020 we have exactly according to the statistics of the uh, ministry of health we have 11 psychiatrists for a population of 20 to 24 million inhabitants and, and it's important to also invest in the training of the human resources in this field and i think there is a desire a political desire in fact which is lacking and almost all the psychiatrists nationwide are, are trained outside of cameroon in the in fact in the fun the fun university in senegal and others are trained in the uk in france in germany and in fact one of the observations that i made a few years ago is that uh, where there were three to four psychiatrists in cameroon well there were more there were more Cameroonese psychiatrists in France than in Cameroon itself. And so this is definitely a major problem that needs to be addressed. There's also the stigma, the stigma which burdens, obviously, these issues of mental health, where t generally uh, there seems to be a, an association between uh, craziness and mental health and so there's a, a stigma for patients to seek treatment when they're suffering from mental health Merci. disorders. Merci, Professor, uh, Akana. Uh, Thank you, Professor uh, Akana. I have two questions, one for Mrs. Kassem and one for Dr. Butwib. So before asking you a question, it's by way of conclusion, even that you will be giving us the closing remarks, And I would like to thank you in advance of uh, answering briefly. So in households, uh, the situation is alarming. There's a loss of freedom, loss of revenue, or the fear of loss of revenue, loss of social marks. And so how do women manage their spouses? And even maybe the conversely, how do husbands manage, quote unquote, their wives and, or spouses? 
Well, <laughs> well, I think that couples, first of all, they have to be aware of the fact that it is a difficult time. The whole world is going through. One of the couples might be, for example, juggling between jobs due to the massive layoffs that are happening and taking place everywhere. This could, uh, this could, uh, you know, affect. Uh, this could affect the way they interact with each other. Um, for example, um, they might. Uh, they have to. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. They have to be realizing the fact that they have to make this life. And it, it has, they have to pass this time. They have to set their priorities and try to make them clear in front of them. If, if the partner, they believe that they love each other, know what is happening, embrace what it, they are exploring and their partner, try to ignore unnecessary uh, conflicts and let them, let them go, these minor conflicts. For the effect usually, on accumulating problems is massive and can break up families. If the solidarity of the family is important for the person, they should not give up on each other. This is the time where we can show how much we want this family to stay together. We have to speak up about our problems. We have to speak up about everything that's bothering us and try to be wise about solving them. There will come a time when some stories, uh, you know, we think about them that it will bring a good laugh. It's up to the person, the way they look at things. Really, it's a very difficult time. And when I listen to, to, to the distinguished panelists, sometimes really uh, I felt, um, you know, overstressed myself, being aware also of what's going on. But then when we think that we have no way out, I think scholars like yourself, I am, I am a political sociologist, I'm not, much of a, uh, you know, involved in the psychological aspect of the pandemic. However, uh, we need scholars to set a clear and, and, and uh, you know, rigid standards as how to go because communities, the whole communities are in distress and nobody knows what to do it during because of this uh, chaos that's taking place. So thank you very much for inviting me and sorry for the interruptions. Thank you very much. Il n'y a aucun problème, Madame Passem. Ce sont des choses qui arrivent. Je retiendrai de votre intervention que on peut considérer à quelque chose. I might conclude from your presentation that COVID is also a form of a couples therapy. That would be a great news. I mean, if at least we, if we take on this conclusion. So for you, Mrs. Butwe, Dr. Butwe, we saw that most. Uh, that most uh, physicians uh, privilege lives over uh, the economy and by trying to maintain to strike a balance and so the big has been uh, unfortunately the loser in this game quote unquote has been this mental health because it is invisible and remains invisible and is only through webinars and webinars and webinars and webinars that this mental health has been able to reimpose itself so, so wouldn't you say that uh, the silver lining of this uh, crisis that uh, the mental health has been uh, shed, 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 there's sh light has been shed on mental health, and uh, we might say that this was a silver lining of the pandemic, and so and that mental health is a sort of right that would be reinstated and to give the full the full importance to mental health as it is uh, at is as it should be, and so in a sense, yes, I might I did mention that. Uh, in my during my during my story or during my presentation that at a given time psychological psychological um, psychological um, hotlines well brought together brought together different uh, mental health specialists, so uh, speech speech therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and everyone joined forces and worked together. And maybe this will be the beginning of, uh, of a long and prosperous cooperation, collaboration, and maybe all of these mental health special specialists will be able to continue working together. So I'd simply like to go back on the issue that you raised 
uh, uh, Professor Rusrazi regarding the vaccines that might improve uh, these uh, psychological issues or have a positive impact on psychological issues. And I do agree with him in saying that the uh, vaccine won't uh, won't uh, tackle uh, psychological issues, but rather the vaccine is here to to uh, to curb the uh, impact of the pandemic. It's not because we will no longer will have the virus will no longer be around. Hopefully the vaccine vaccine will help us achieve that goal, that once the, the virus will be gone, this is when we'll have to handle mental health, the mental health repercussions. I might even say that we will have an explosion of mental health disorders. So in the same vein as the post-lockdown period, which has pushed people to this outburst of joy, and uh, in, which in turn translated into an, a, a surge of COVID cases, since two people will want to express themselves. And where I disagree with Professor Razi is that once that COVID will be behind us, well, I will no longer want to, I will no longer want to maybe uh, give my put out for, to, to have my to have my my temperature checked or or but i do think that people will be eager to regain that physical contact in fact at the end of each consultation the elderly patients that came to me came to see me for sessions well often wanted to wanted a hug to say goodbye and this is something that's no longer possible today and this is a simple gesture to say that uh, we need that physical contact as human beings so maybe in the post covid era w there will be a return this return to normalcy but maybe in a de in an ex in a an exaggerated the 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 other side of this the 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 repercussions of this isolation. This is when it will be important to focus on mental health. And I think it's important to anticipate the situation and start tackling these issues ahead of time. So yes, it is very hard to discuss a struggling, a struggling, uh, str struggling planet from the stand from the stance of mental health in 90 minutes. So I will conclude, and so I would like to ask you a question on the method of Dr. Butbib. I would like to ask you to uh, tell us, uh, in remaining optimistic, if you could draw or paint a picture of this see our planet in the next few years. So this is the same question that I'm asking to all the speakers. You might take turns. I'd like to ask you all to take turns, answer this question based on your uh, specialty and your perspective. Thank you. Yes. Madam oh, Kassi. Kassi. <laughs> all right. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I'm optimistic. I'm very optimistic, truly, because before the uh, pandemic, the world was going crazy and we feel it back from our country in Lebanon you know we feel all the stress and all the all the challenges that's happening because of uh, of probably the location of our country in the midst of of all the struggles that are happening and uh, you know because of the pandemic people are reconsidering their actions the whole world was going in a trend uh, that was buying itself Maybe the, the pandemic was good because it really gave a big, big shock. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, that women step step forward and and uh, you know um, you know took uh, their, they did a lot of things uh, during that time that uh, where the role became very important in the country in my country. Uh, so I think we are reconsidering uh, our actions. We are reconsidering probably uh, the way we look at things, uh, the the uh, the uh, you know the things that the way that we live, our lifestyles has changed, and I think this is for the better, because so many things we don't do, we don't need, we we get usually, or so many actions we don't need to do, uh, you know we are looking at them now from a different perspective. And globally, on a global level, it's also, uh, I think, uh, I'm really optimistic about the situation. I don't know if the, uh, <laughs> the other panelists, they feel that, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Fatima said, uh, uh, she thinks that uh, the uh, life is going to, the course of life, the course of humanity is going to take uh, its course and we are going to act you know, with our the, the our uh, fine gestures that we used to do, 
uh, it will, it will, but it's going to be, I think, reshaped in a different way. It's going to be, uh, you know, big changes are happening, but I'm optimistic about the change because we are looking for change because we are never, we have never been satisfied with the uh, old life that we've been living. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Kassem. <laughs> Mr. Akana, how do you see things unfolding in the next months or years ahead? Or are you optimistic? I'm not sure if I've ever been optimistic, but in any case, I think it's very difficult to play Nostradamus or at the risk of playing being an imposter but out on a on a more joking aside at least i would have contributed to the world being a better place and for this planet to be more inhabitable um and to uh, and to leave it as a better leave this world into uh, you know better than it was yesterday you know better than yesterday that it was yesterday seems that the speaker is on mute. Dr. Potrib, if you could kindly unmute yourself. Okay, could you kindly repeat what you had said? So I was saying that I agree with Professor Akana and saying that, yes, it is indeed quite complicated to uh, play Nostradamus. And I might add that I do remain optimistic whereas drawn some um, some good lessons and so now the question is whether we're going to stick to these uh, uh, to these lessons learned or will we forget <laughs> or will we forget about them and so will it, will, i mean considering this isn't the first pandemic that humanity has been faced with and there have been pandemics before now if we can learn some lessons uh, after this pandemic further appreciate the smaller things of life and the important things and the fundamental things in life and not take things for granted, not take the, the earth granted, the, to our human interaction for granted, the solidarity. So all these beautiful things that we were able to see in our first chapter of the pandemic. Now, will things continue or will we forget about all this? Well, I mean, the future remains, I mean, the future will tell us, I mean, this is what we'll, this is what we'll discover in the future. So let's, let's keep things interesting and in, let's keep things interesting and in crunchy. So, uh, Mr. Razi, I, I kept you, uh, I uh, let, saved your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, there is intervention no last given you're right here next to me about this natural reaction of human being as uh, my friend dr what was talking about yes the we have the capacity to recover our daily performance but in the same time i mean if you are looking to those big crises in history mainly this one you will feel that there is also uh, monitoring of this crisis to introduce or to speed up some projects that were not there was a resistance i'm talking about the robotism i'm talking about the smart city security tools i mean to 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 cover the whole cities with cameras checkpoints uh, i'm talking about artificial intelligence which is competing today I mean, our human intelligence in the management of even of sciences. So those elements will, will continue, I guess. They were speed up. We have accepted them easily because we were in time of fear. But I'm sure I'm also optimistic if you are talking about this, our capacity of resilience. But definitely, uh, I mean, we will recover our life uh, I mean, maybe in another 2.0. I mean, there is no 1.0 anymore. 2020 it will not will never be repeated yet. We will not recover, get, get back to 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 the number n. Uh, 
maintenir ce message d'espoir, ce message d'optimisme, parce qu'effectivement, l'année 2020... It is true that the year 2020 was a very challenging one, and we hope that 2021 will be a brighter and will have some, will be a more optimistic. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for having taken part in this uh, webinar, having attended this webinar, um, the Atlantic Dialogues. Uh, uh, and so, I'd like to thank you all once again for your participation, and I wish you all an excellent year 2020. The coronavirus outbreak is rapidly changing our planning and orientations as the world is trying to cope with COVID-19 and face its consequences and challenges. At the Policy Center for the New South, we gave our annual Atlantic Dialogues flagship conference a one-year rest while embracing the rapid digitalization brought forth by the pandemic to offer a virtual alternative. This year's online AD Talks are digitally bringing together the AD community that is at the heart of the conference's success, growth, and sustainability.